The Purple Pileus by H. G. Wells Mr. Coombs was sick of life. He walked away from his unhappy home, and sick not only of his own existence but of everybody else's turned aside down Gaswork Lane to avoid the town and crossing the wooden bridge that goes over the canal to Starling's cottages, was presently alone in the damp pine woods and out of sight and sound of human habitation. He would stand it no longer. He repeated aloud with blasphemies unusual to him that he would stand it no longer. He was a pale-faced little man with dark eyes and a fine and very black mustache. He had a very stiff upright collar slightly frayed that gave him an illusory double chin, and his overcoat, albeit shabby, was trimmed with astrakhan. His gloves were a bright brown with black stripes over the knuckles and split at the finger ends. His appearance, his wife had said once in the dear dead days beyond recall, before he married her, that is, was military. But now she called him it seems a dreadful thing to tell of between husband and wife, but she called him a little grub. It wasn't the only thing that she had called him, either. The row had arisen about that beastly Jenny again. Jenny was his wife's friend, and by no invitation of Mr. Coombs she came in every blessed Sunday to dinner, and made a shindy all the afternoon. She was a big, noisy girl with a taste for loud colors and a strident laugh and this Sunday she had outdone all her previous intrusions by bringing in a fellow with her, a, a chap as showy as herself. And Mr. Coombs, in a starchy clean collar and his Sunday frock coat, had sat dumb and wrathful at his own table, while his wife and her guests talked foolishly and undesirably, and laughed aloud. Well, he stood that, and after dinner, which, as usual, was late, what must Miss Jenny do but go to the piano and play banjo tunes, for all the world as if it were a weekday? Flesh and blood could not endure such goings-on. They would hear next door, they would hear in the road. It was a public announcement of their disrepute. He had to speak. He had felt himself go pale, and a kind of rigor had affected his respiration as he delivered himself. He had been sitting on one of the chairs by the window. The new guest had taken possession of the armchair. He turned his head. Sunday, he said over the collar in the voice of one who warns. Sunday, what people call a nasty tone it was. Jenny had kept on playing, but his wife, who was looking through some music that was piled on top of the piano, had stared at him. What's wrong now, she said. Can't people enjoy themselves? I don't mind rational enjoyment at all, said little Coombs, but I ain't a-goin' to have weekday tunes playing on a Sunday in this house. What's wrong with my playing now? said Jenny, stopping and twirling round on the music stool with a monstrous rustle of flounces. Coombs saw it was going to be a row and opened too vigorously, as is common with your timid, nervous men all the world over. Steady on with that music stool, said he. It ain't made for heavyweights. Never you mind about weights, said Jenny, incensed. What was you saying behind my back about my playing? Surely you don't hold with not having a bit of music on Sunday, Mr. Coombs, said the new guest, leaning back in the armchair, blowing a cloud of cigarette smoke and smiling in a kind of pitying way. And simultaneously his wife said something to Jenny about, Never mind him. You go on, Jenny. I do, said Mr. Coombs, addressing the new guest. May I ask why, said the new guest, evidently enjoying both his cigarette and the prospect of an argument. He was, by the by, a lank young man, very stylishly dressed in bright drab, with a white cravat and a pearl and silver pin. It had been better taste to come in a black coat, Mr. Coombs thought. Because, began Mr. Coombs, it don't suit me. I'm a business man. I have to study my connection. Rational enjoyment. His connection! said Mrs. Coombs scornfully. That's what he's always a-saying. We got to do this, and we got to do that. If you don't mean to study my connection, said Mr. Coombs, what did you marry me for? I wonder, said Jenny, and turned back to the piano. I never saw such a man as you, said Mrs. Coombs. You've altered all round since we were married. Before... Then Jenny began at the turn, turn, turn again. 
"'Look here,' said Mr. Coombs, driven at last to revolt, standing up and raising his voice. "'I tell you, I won't have that!' The frock-coat heaved with his indignation. "'No violence now,' said the long young man in drab, sitting up. "'Who the juice are you?' said Mr. Coombs fiercely. Whereupon they all began talking at once. The new guest said he was Jenny's intended and meant to protect her and Mr. Coombs said he was welcome to do so anywhere but in his, Mr. Coombs's house. And Mrs. Coombs said he ought to be ashamed of insulting his guests, and, as I have already mentioned, that he was getting a regular little grub. And the end was that Mr. Coombs ordered his visitors out of the house, and they wouldn't go. And so he said he would go himself. With his face burning and tears of excitement in his eyes, he went into the passage, and as he struggled with his overcoat, his frock coat sleeves got consternated up his arm, and gave a brush at his silk hat, Jenny began again at the piano, and strumming him insultingly out of the house. Turn, turn, turn. He slammed the shop door so that the house quivered. That, briefly, was the immediate making of his mood. You will perhaps begin to understand his disgust with existence. As he walked along the muddy path under the firs, it was late October, and the ditches and heaps of fir needles were gorgeous with clumps of fungi, he recapitulated the melancholy history of his marriage. It was brief and commonplace enough. He now perceived with sufficient clearness that his wife had married him out of a natural curiosity and in order to escape from her worrying, laborious, and uncertain life in the workroom and like the majority of her class she was far too stupid to realize that it was her duty to cooperate with him in his business she was greedy of enjoyment loquacious and socially minded and evidently disappointed to find the restraints of poverty still hanging about her his worries exasperated her and the slightest attempt to control her proceedings resulted in a charge of grumbling why couldn't he be nice as he used to be and coombs was such a harmless little man too nourished mentally on self-help, and with a meager ambition of self-denial and competition that was to end in a sufficiency. Then Jenny came in as a female Mephistopheles, a gabbling chronicle of fellers, and was always wanting his wife to go to theaters and all that. And in addition were aunts of his wife and cousins, male and female, to eat up capital, insult him personally, upset business arrangements, annoy good customers, and generally blight his life. It was not the first occasion by many that Mr. Coombs had fled his home in wrath and indignation, and something like fear, vowing furiously and even aloud that he wouldn't stand it, and so frothing away his energy along the line of least resistance. But never before had he been quite so sick of life as on this particular Sunday afternoon. The Sunday dinner may have had its share in his despair, and the grayness of the sky. Perhaps, too, he was beginning to realize his unendurable frustration as a businessman as the consequence of his marriage. Presently bankruptcy, and after that, perhaps she might have reason to repent when it was too late. And destiny, as I have already intimated, had planted the path through the wood with evil-smelling fungi, thickly and variously planted it, not only on the right side, but on the left. A small shopman is in such a melancholy position if his wife turns out a disloyal partner. His capital is all tied up in his business, and to leave her means to join the unemployed in some strange part of the earth. The luxuries of divorce are beyond him altogether, so that the good old tradition of marriage, for better or worse, holds inexorably for him, and things work up to tragic culminations. Bricklayers kick their wives to death, and dukes betray theirs, but it is among the small clerks and shopkeepers nowadays that it comes most often to a cutting of throats. Under the circumstances it is not so very remarkable, and you must take it as charitably as you can, that the mind of Mr. Coombs ran for a while on some such glorious close to his disappointed hopes, and that he thought of razors and pistols and bread-knives and touching letters to the coroner, denouncing his enemies by name and praying piously for forgiveness. After a time his fierceness gave way to melancholia. He had been married in this very overcoat, in his first and only frock-coat that was buttoned up beneath it. He began to recall their courting along this very walk, his years of penurious savings to get capital, and the bright hopefulness of his marrying days. For it all to work out like this. 
Was there no sympathetic ruler anywhere in the world? He reverted to death as a topic. He thought of the canal he had just crossed, and doubted whether he shouldn't stand with his head out, even in the middle. And it was while drowning was in his mind that the purple pileus caught his eye. He looked at it mechanically for a moment, and stopped and stooped towards it to pick it up, under the impression that it was some such small leather object as a purse. Then he saw that it was the purple top of a fungus, a peculiarly poisonous-looking purple, slimy, shiny, and emitting a sour odor. He hesitated with his hand an inch or so from it, and the thought of poison crossed his mind. With that he picked the thing and stood up again with it in his hand. The odor was certainly strong, acrid, but by no means disgusting. He broke off a piece, and the fresh surface was a creamy white that changed like magic in the space of ten seconds to a yellowish-green color. It was even an inviting-looking change. He broke off two other pieces to see it repeated. They were wonderful things, these fungi, thought Mr. Coombs, and all of them the deadliest poisons, as his father had often told him, deadly poisons. There is no time like the present for a rash resolve. Why not here and now, thought Mr. Coombs. He tasted a little piece, a very little piece indeed, a mere crumb. It was so pungent that he almost spat it out again, then merely hot and full-flavored, a kind of German mustard with a touch of horseradish and, well, mushroom. He swallowed it in the excitement of the moment. Did he like it or did he not? His mind was curiously careless. He would try another bit. It really wasn't bad. It was good. He forgot his troubles in the interest of the immediate moment. Playing with death, it was. He took another bite and then deliberately finished a mouthful. A curious tingling sensation began in his fingertips and toes. His pulse began to move faster. The blood in his ears sounded like a mill race. Try a bit more, said Mr. Coombs. He turned and looked about him and found his feet unsteady. He saw and struggled towards a little patch of purple a dozen yards away. "'Jolly good stuff,' said Mr. Coombs. E lo more ye. He pitched forward and fell on his face, his hands outstretched towards the cluster of pilei. But he did not eat any more of them. He forgot forthwith. He rolled over and sat up with a look of astonishment on his face. His carefully brushed silk hat had rolled away towards the ditch. He pressed his hand to his brow. Something had happened, but he could not rightly determine what it was. Anyhow, he was no longer dull. He felt bright, cheerful, and his throat was afire. He laughed in the sudden gaiety of his heart. Had he been dull? He did not know. But at any rate he would be dull no longer. He got up and stood unsteadily, regarding the universe with an agreeable smile. He began to remember. He could not remember very well because of a steam roundabout that was beginning in his head. And he knew he had been disagreeable at home just because they wanted to be happy. They were quite right. Life should be as gay as possible. He would go home and make it up and reassure them. And why not take some of this delightful toadstool with him, for them to eat? A hatful, no less. Some of those red ones with white spots as well, and a few yellow. He had been a dull dog, an enemy to merriment. He would make up for it. It would be gay to turn his coat sleeves inside out and stick some yellow gorse in his waistcoat pockets. Then home, singing, for a jolly evening. After the departure of Mr. Coombs, Jenny discontinued playing and turned round on the music stool again. What a fuss about nothing, said Jenny. You see, Mr. Clarence, what I've got to put up with, said Mrs. Coombs. He is a bit hasty, said Mr. Clarence, judicially. He ain't got the slightest sense of our position, said Mrs. Coombs. That's what I complain of. He cares for nothing but his old shop. And if I have a bit of company, or buy anything to keep myself decent, or get any little thing I want out of the housekeeping money, there's disagreeables. Economy, he says, struggle for life and all that. He, he lies awake of nights about it, worrying how he can screw me out of a shilling. He wanted us to eat Dorset butter once. If once I was to give in to him, there. Of course, said Jenny. If a man values a woman, said Mr. Clarence, lounging back in the armchair, he must be prepared to make sacrifices for her. 
For my own part, said Mr. Clarence, with his eye on Jenny, I shouldn't think of marrying till I was in a position to do the thing in style. It's downright selfishness. A man ought to go through the rough and tumble by himself, and not drag her. I don't agree altogether with that, said Jenny. I don't see why a man shouldn't have a woman's help, provided he doesn't treat her meanly, you know. It's meanness. You wouldn't believe, said Mrs. Coombs, but I was a fool to have him. I might have known. If it hadn't been for my father, we wouldn't have had not a carriage at our wedding. Lord, he didn't stick out at that, said Mr. Clarence, quite shocked. Said he wanted the money for his stock, or some such rubbish. Why, he wouldn't have a woman in to help me once a week if it wasn't for my standing out plucky. And the fusses he makes about money. Comes to me, well, pretty near crying, with sheets of paper and figures. If only we can tide over this year, he says. The business is bound to go. If only we can tide over this year, I says, then it'll be if only we can tide over next year. I know you, I says, and you don't catch me screwing myself lean and ugly. Why didn't you marry a slavey, I says, if you wanted one, instead of a respectable girl, I says. So, Mrs. Coombs, but we will not follow this unedifying conversation further. Suffice it that Mr. Coombs was very satisfactorily disposed of, and they had a snug little time round the fire. Then Mrs. Coombs went to get the tea, and Jenny sat coquettishly on the arm of Mr. Clarence's chair until the tea-things clattered outside. "'What was that I heard?' asked Mrs. Coombs playfully as she entered, and there was a badinage about kissing. They were just sitting down to the little circular table when the first intimation of Mr. Coombs' return was heard. This was a fumbling at the latch of the front door. "'Here's my lord,' said Mrs. Coombs. "'Went out like a lion and comes back like a lamb, I'll lay.' Something fell over in the shop. A chair, it sounded like. Then there was a sound as of some complicated step exercise in the passage. Then the door opened and Coombs appeared. But it was Coombs transfigured. The immaculate collar had been torn carelessly from his throat. His carefully brushed silk hat, half full of a crush of fungi, was under one arm. His coat was inside out, and his waistcoat adorned with bunches of yellow-blossomed fursy. These little eccentricities of Sunday costume, however, were quite overshadowed by the change in his face. It was livid white. His eyes were unnaturally large and bright, and his pale blue lips were drawn back in a cheerless grin. "'Murray!' he said. He had stopped dancing to open the door. "'Rational enjoyment, Dance!' He made three fantastic steps into the room and stood bowing. "'Jim!' shrieked Mrs. Coombs, and Mr. Clarence sat petrified with a dropping lower jaw. "'Tea!' said Mr. Coombs. "'Jolly thing, tea. Toastools, too, brochure.' "'He's drunk,' said Jenny in a weak voice. Never before had she seen this intense pallor in a drunken man, or such shining dilated eyes. Mr. Coombs held out a handful of scarlet agaric to Mr. Clarence. "'Joe Stuff,' said he, "'to some.' At that moment he was genial. Then at the sight of their startled faces he changed, with the swift transition of insanity into overbearing fury, and it seemed as if he had suddenly recalled the quarrel of his departure. In such a huge voice as Mrs. Coombs had never heard before, he shouted, "'My house! I'm master here! Eat what I give you!' He bawled this, as it seemed, without an effort, without a violent gesture, standing there as motionless as one who whispers, holding out a handful of fungus. Clarence approved himself a coward. He could not meet the mad fury in Coombs's eyes. He rose to his feet, pushing back his chair, and turned, stooping. At that Coombs rushed him. Jenny saw her opportunity, and with the ghost of a shriek made for the door. Mrs. Coombs followed her. Clarence tried to dodge. Over went the tea-table with a smash as Coombs clutched him by the collar and tried to thrust the fungus into his mouth. Clarence was content to leave his collar behind him and shot out into the passage with red patches of fly agaric still adherent to his face. "'Shut him in!' cried Mrs. Coombs, and would have closed the door, but her supports deserted her. Jenny saw the shop-door open and vanished, thereby locking it behind her, while Clarence went on hastily into the kitchen. Mr. Coombs came heavily against the door, and Mrs. Coombs, finding the key was inside, fled upstairs and locked herself in the spare bedroom. 
So the new convert to joie de vivre emerged upon the passage, his decorations a little scattered, but that respectable hatful of fungi still under his arm. He hesitated at the three ways and decided on the kitchen, whereupon Clarence, who was fumbling with the key, gave up the attempt to imprison his host and fled into the scullery, only to be captured before he could open the door into the yard. Mr. Clarence is singularly reticent of the details of what occurred. It seems that Mr. Coombs's transitory irritation had vanished again, and he was once more a genial playfellow. And as there were knives and meat-choppers about, Clarence very generously resolved to humor him and so avoid anything tragic. It is beyond dispute that Mr. Coombs played with Mr. Clarence to his heart's content. They could not have been more playful and familiar if they had known each other for years. He insisted gaily on Clarence trying the fungi, and after a friendly tussle was smitten with remorse at the mess he was making of his guest's face. It also appears that Clarence was dragged under the sink and his face scrubbed with the blacking brush, he being still resolved to humor the lunatic at any cost, and that finally, in a somewhat disheveled, chipped, and discolored condition, he was assisted to his coat and shown out by the back door, the shopway being barred by Jenny. Mr. Coombs's wandering thoughts then turned to Jenny. Jenny had been unable to unfasten the shop door, but she shot the bolts against Mr. Coombs's latch key and remained in possession of the shop for the rest of the evening. It would appear that Mr. Coombs then returned to the kitchen, still in pursuit of gaiety, and, albeit a strict good Templar, drank or spilt down the front of his first and only frock coat no less than five bottles of the stout Mrs. Coombs insisted upon having for her health's sake. He made cheerful noises by breaking off the necks of the bottles with several of his wife's wedding present dinner plates, and during the earlier part of this great drunk he sang divers merry ballads. He cut his finger rather badly with one of the bottles, the only bloodshed in this story, and what with that, and the systematic convulsion of his inexperienced physiology by the licorice brand of Mrs. Coombs's stout, it may be the evil of the fungus poison was somehow allayed but we prefer to draw a veil over the concluding incidents of this Sunday afternoon. They ended in the coal cellar in a deep and healing sleep. An interval of five years elapsed. Again it was a Sunday afternoon in October, and again Mr. Coombs walked through the pine wood beyond the canal. He was still the same dark-eyed, black-mustached little man that he was at the outset of the story, but his double chin was now scarcely so illusory as it had been. His overcoat was new, with a velvet lapel and a stylish collar with turned-down corners free of any coarse starchiness had replaced the original all-around article. His hat was glossy, his gloves newish, though one finger had split and been carefully mended, and a casual observer would have noticed about him a certain rectitude of bearing, a certain erectness of head that marks the man who thinks well of himself. He was a master now, with three assistants. Beside him walked a larger sunburnt parody of himself, his brother Tom, just back from Australia. They were recapitulating their early struggles, and Mr. Coombs had just been making a financial statement. It's a very nice little business, Jim, said brother Tom. In these days of competition you're jolly lucky to have worked it up so, and you're jolly lucky, too, to have a wife who's willing to help you like yours does. Between ourselves, said Mr. Coombs, it wasn't always so. It wasn't always like this. To begin with, the missus was a bit giddy. Girls are funny creatures. Dear me. Yes, you'd hardly think it, but she was downright extravagant, and always having slaps at me. I was a bit too easy and loving and all that, and she thought the whole blessed show was run for her. Turned the house into a regular caravansary always having her relations and girls from business in, and their chaps. Comic songs a Sunday it was getting to, and driving trade away. And she was making eyes at the chaps, too. I tell you, Tom, the place wasn't my own. Shouldn't have thought it. It was so. Well, I reasoned with her. I said, I ain't a duke to keep a wife like a pet animal. I married you for help and company, I said. You got to help and pull the business through. She wouldn't hear of it. Very well, I says. I'm a mild man till I'm roused, I says, and it's getting to that. But she wouldn't hear of no warnings. Well? It's the way with women. 
She didn't think I had it in me to be roused. The women of her sort, between ourselves, Tom, don't respect a man until they're a bit afraid of him. So I just broke out to show her. In comes a girl named Jenny that used to work with her and her chap. We'd had a bit of a row, and I came out here. It was just such another day as this, and I thought it all out. Then I went back and pitched into them. You did? I did. I was mad, I can tell you. I wasn't going to hit her if I could help it, so I went back and licked into this chap just to show her what I could do. He was a big chap, too. Well, I chucked him and smashed things about and gave her a scaring, and she ran up and locked herself into the spare room. Well? That's all. I says to her the next morning, now you know, I says, what I'm like when I'm roused. And I didn't have to say anything more. And you've been happy ever after, eh? So to speak, there's nothing like putting your foot down with them. If it hadn't been for that afternoon, I should have been trampin' the roads now. And she'd have been grumblin' at me, and all her family grumblin' for bringing her to poverty. I know their little ways. But we're all right now, and it's a very decent little business, as you say. They proceeded on their way meditatively. Women are funny creatures, said Brother Tom. They want a firm hand, said Coombs. What a lot of these funguses there are about here, remarked Brother Tom presently. I can't see what use they are in the world. Mr. Coombs looked. I de say they're sent for some wise purpose, said Mr. Coombs. And that was as much thanks as the purple Pileus ever got for maddening this absurd little man to the pitch of decisive action, and so altering the whole course of his life. 